Now, um, I've already been approached a couple of times about this, about my name, because uh, I originally, it's not in my not in my little bio that's in there, but I used to be a marine biologist, So, and some of you that have been in the industry for a while might remember another person that was exactly the same name as me that used to be in the Commercial Fisheries Association, Peter Stevens. Some of you, how many people remember Peter? Yeah, good, yeah. So he was a little bit larger than me and quite a bit older than me when I was in there, but you imagine me being a... Um, a scientist that had the same name as someone who uh, famously came out with some uh, quite outrageous sayings about uh, the way the ecosystems work. And so I'm very glad to be back here uh, 20 odd years later. Um, and in fact, uh, well, 30 years probably from that, because I was around when the TA, uh, the total allowable catches were set, that process, we're working at, M at uh, what was Fisheries Research Division. So, but I've moved on from that a lot at the moment, and now I'm the CEO of Standards Organisation GS1. Many of you are members of ours, and we'll come back to a little bit about why, but we're going to start off with something first. So you may have noticed that on the, your tables, there's some ingredients, a pile, of, a pile of paper, that when you turn them over or turn them up, there's going to be some ingredients on here. And we're, going to have, we're going to give you 120 seconds. This is by popular demand from the CEO of the, uh, the seafood industry, who saw this. And what we're going to get you to do is we're going to get you quickly, all, you should have one ingredient on each table, 120 seconds, apologies for you guys on the back, but I want you to try to build the most delectable pizza by trading ingredients across. So you've got 120 seconds to scamper around some of the tables, find the ingredients, trade. You can trade one for one, or you can trade one for many actually. Let's give you a frequency, because some of you don't have some products that's very nice, so go. Thirty seconds. Get ready to return to your tables. I haven't had any auctions here. Someone trying to auction some mountain oysters. This table's probably got mountain oysters they want to give away. Time out. Sit down, you guys that are still trading in the room here. We know you're all traders. Okay, so hopefully you've made some really nice tasting pizzas that you'll be able to share later on. You're going to have to build that late tonight. No, actually joking. But we have had notification via SMS that there's a problem with the tomato paste. And so those of you that have got tomato paste in your pizza now, I want you to look on the back and see whether you've got batch one, two, three. If you have on your table, because you please put your hand up. You've got this table, this table, right. One, two, three. Well, actually, it's got listeria in it. And you need to work out who you bought it from. So what was the source, please? <laughs> who did you trade off? <laughs> Tom tomato, yes, tomato paste. So it's batch one, two, three. Okay. Now, a simple stunt, a simple stunt that actually is not copyright Peter Stevens nor GS1. It came from the Global Food Safety Initiative. Of course, it's a, it's a great thing, isn't it? You always are focusing on what you're trading, building something, and particularly when it's an ingredient, if you end up having a major problem and you have to have a recall, then suddenly you, have, you wish you knew who you'd bought everything from and actually trace the product through. So today I've been asked to repeat something that I gave to an agribusiness um, session uh, forum earlier in the year that really is sharpening on why is traceability so much on everybody's agenda, and particularly the relevance of WPC 80, to what's going to happen in New Zealand. Now, I'm not a regulator. I'm certainly not the regulator. I'm here because we're members of you. But we're going to touch on some of the key concepts and we'll talk about, finish off by talking about trust. So certainly, when you come to food scares, there's been a lot of them. Luckily, not here. OK? Not here. There have been some that have been lethal here, most notably around meat products and some other things that have been. But the number of recalls we're dealing with is escalating. It's quite astounding in food and grocery now. There's about 40 recalls a quarter going through, recalls and withdrawals, where products being pulled off the shelves in New Zealand stores. Some of them health and safety issues, some are not. But we haven't had anything like these, and hopefully we're not going to see anything like the last one. Now, scares have made a huge impact on the consumers. Consumers have, tr the trust in the processed food sector in particular has decreased globally. We just talk about China. There are other drivers that also we're seeing and I've given a couple here, illegal, fish, illegal fishing, the EU has tightened up on that. They want to know about traceability back to a legal basis of, uh, for catch. 
Uh, also, the strict new rules that are coming into force in EU, which we'll come back to later, about labelling on consumer-based product, which even require the catch method to be disclosed. Now, the Europeans are not just doing this for their own sakes, just to make rules. They're actually reflecting some of the concerns around, I want to know how this product was caught in this particular case, where did it come from, how has it been treated, is it old, is it really fresh? Then we see other things where some people might say it's greenwash, some may not, but increasingly retailers, which are really the surrogates of the consumers, are protecting their brand by wanting to know more about what the product is and where it's come from. And they want it, traceability is a key driver for them. But increasingly we're seeing more that is being driven by consumers on their own. Quite an impactful study, certainly in our world and perhaps in yours, was two and a bit years ago now, it was revealed that 40% of cell phones, iPhones in the States, had scanned a GS1 barcode. You know, GS1 barcodes, you'll come to on, on the products in the shelves, on the shelves and supermarkets and the things, had scanned a GS1 barcode, but yet a scanner, a barcode scanner, was not downloaded with when you buy it from Apple. So what were these people downloading? They've downloaded an app to do something. Now, the most obvious thing is they've actually been wanting to do price comparison soft, comparison soft. Tell me more about the product and is it cheap around the corner? But these apps that are being dry, that, are dry, that consumers have in their hand, and increasingly there's also EU1169, which is around distance selling in the States, which states that if it's a food product, there must be a degree of disclosure when you're in a digital space, selling at a distance around ingredients, allergens, country of origin about products on the mobile device or on a cell phone or a kiosk, sorry, a, a, a computer, before the purchase. If you can't display that information and it's not right, the retailer can't sell a product online. They can sell it in their stores, meaning you can be in Tesco's but you won't be on Tesco's online. So now you may know about this, hopefully, if not, your importers that are in, in country are having to do that for you at the moment. So let's actually say, well, is this silly? How far could this go? And I want to play this little video, which I think will be amusing. It's from the guilt trip. You probably know about this. It's a comedy. But I think it's, it, it's absurd, but... you got great eyes. It's like, I'm just a guy. You're my guy. I am your guy. Hey guys. Hello. Hi, hello. My name is Dana. I'll be uh, taking care of you today. If you have any questions about the menu, please let me know. I guess I do have a question about the chicken. If you could just tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, the chicken is a heritage breed, uh, woodland raised chicken that's been fed a diet of sheep's milk, soy, and hazelnuts. Okay, this is, this is local? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to ask you just one more time, and it's local. It is. Is that USDA organic or Oregon organic or Portland organic? It's just all across the board, organic. The hazelnuts, these are local. Uh, how big is the area where the chickens are able to roam free? I'm sorry to interrupt, I had exactly the same question. Four acres. Mm -hmm. Give me just a second, I'll mm -hmm. be right back, okay? Okay. Okay. She's okay. nice. Well, you're doing the right thing. I'm too apologetic. You are. I, I drove way too slow here today, didn't I? Yeah. I am so weird with that gas pedal, I think just moves the whole vehicle forward now. All oh, right, so here is the chicken you'll be oh, enjoying yeah. tonight. You have this information, this is fantastic. Absolutely, uh, his name was Colin. <laughs> here are his papers, okay? That's great. He, he looks like a happy little yeah. guy who runs around. A lot of friends, other chickens as friends. Putting his little <laughs> wing around another one and kind of like you know, palling around. I don't know that I can speak to that level of uh, intimate knowledge about him. Um, they. Okay, so you get the idea, this is, you know, the point is not to say that this is what's going to really happen, but actually it's the direction of travel which is important to take out of this. We know that the environment's changed, and what this challenge really for you all in the room in New Zealand is really to work out where we need to position for future demands, and think about that, even if you don't act this afternoon. So I know some of you know GS1, but some of you don't. So we're a global organisation, 112 countries. Um, about two million members, because we actually were a not-for-profit uh, in New Zealand, we're in corporate society, in other countries, we're owned by the government, we're part of in China and Vietnam and places like this, but typically we're all not-for-profit owned by our members. Um, globally our board, 
that represents, that drives the standardisation effort, has um, leaders from these types of organisations on there. At the moment, the, uh, the um, global chairman is the, is the current CIO of Tesco, has just moved over to be the CIO of, T of Target in the States. Um, and then um, typically the, VC, the vice chairs are from people like, uh, there's a guy currently from Nestle and one from, um, from in China. So these are the people that sit on our, our local board, is a little bit more uh, diverse, but actually has foodstuffs, the warehouse, Countdown, um, Ansco Foods, you know, Sir Graham Harrison's business, the Ministry of Health, Fletcher Building, all on, all on my local board. Because, and Export New Zealand, Catherine Baird, for example. So where these people give their um, time freely to help out drive the standardisation effort and try to connect New Zealand to the world. And our, the way we connect is through these standards that actually are around identification. That's where the barcode comes from, actually. It's an identification standard. And then automatic data capture, that's the scanners that actually scan a barcode or an RFID tag. And then the ability to share information. And we're going to dig into that a little bit more because it's the essence of traceability. It's about identifying what product is and sharing it with trading partners, particularly those on the other side of the world. So that's the brief intro to why I'm here. Um, but another reason why I'm here is because of this incident. We all know what happened um, on these couple of dates. Uh, a torch dropped into uh, uh, a factory vat, and then uh, a while later there was a recall that was quite substantial in the New Zealand context. It was, it was not a real problem in the end, but actually we all know with the benefit of hindsight that trust was damaged. And the trust was damaged across lots of different dimensions. And I've given some of them here. Regulator and regulator, trading partners. We've heard even yesterday Gross are saying that actually um, that the lifting of some of the controls in Russia has only just started to happen. And there's still some to go. And the key thing that perhaps we need to take away out of this was actually WPC was a key ingredient not a finished product, really. It's an ingredient. It was seen as that. And also, it was seen as relatively low risk. But actually, it was used in high-risk products. OK, so those are two key, key things, an ingredient and also about the way the product and where it was consumed. We know the reputation was damaged. So we also know that there was an administerial inquiry that said, actually, hey, we do a pretty good job in New Zealand. We've got a pretty good, world's, world's best, but we can always do better. And there was a dairy traceability working group set up by the Director General um, under instructions from the, um, the minister, minister to actually look at um, how the regulatory environment uh, should be enhanced and a code of practice. And GS1, in fact, I was personally on this, been a year of my life it felt like, um, with a number of others that were representing different stakeholders. Now primarily this was focused on dairy, which has different issues, but I think the relevancy of it is, is the application across food. And in particular, how, does we, how do we connect to an offshore market or an offshore consumer, particularly if there's a problem? Because actually that's pretty challenging. So that's the context and one of the other reasons why I was invited here. So what came out of the key concepts? What actually came out of this work? Now there's two reports that are openly available and at the moment uh, MPI is working on how the response, the documents were released um, earlier this year and there's a going to be a consultation process around the Food Act, uh, uh, having some changes and you, those of you that have seen the Food Act um, uh, consultation document, there's a very specific Porsche portion in there that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's purple that says the traceability components are up for, for later consultation after the Dairy Traceability Working Group reports back. Now I'm not a regulator so I can't say what the process is. There are some regulators here which you can always ask about later on. Whether they can say is a different issue. But I think there's some key concepts that have come out of this. Certainly from the Working Group it became very clear that the concept of using the same language as our offshore trading partners was becoming very, very important. So talking the same language, not treating New Zealand as an island, and not saying, by the way, we do a good job so you don't need to know anything about what happens in our, in, our, in our country. That has broken down. Actually, because things get complicated, and when things happen, they can happen and they need to happen quickly, but if, if we haven't connected to our offshore markets, then it becomes very, very much harder, and days go by. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I think we need to uh, look at stepping up the way that we do traceability. So let's 
talk about how that works, some key concepts for you, and of course you can read the documents, but in essence, traceability needs to be seen as a process. Now all of you have HACCP as a requirement, and HACCP is a process based around looking at hazards. In fact, traceability is very similar. It says look at the process, the supply chain, the physical ingredient, the physical flow of products from source to ultimate destination, you know, sometimes it's called producer to consumer, I pulled ta tackled laughing gear, I just made that one up, um, farm to fork. Okay, we all know these labels, but actually it's imagining that whole process and realising that actually there's a whole lot of people that are probably, unless you own the whole world or control the whole value chain, there are a number of different parties, some of which you know and some of which you don't know. But all you do know is that increasingly you have a vested interest in connecting to those somehow because at least a consumer may want to know on a phone what the product is, where it's come from. So how do you do that, particularly through intermediaries and particularly if you've got an ingredient that gets transformed into a fi finished product offshore. So the whole process is around looking at that process and as, a, as a whole and understanding that when product moves you need information moving at the same time. And there's a realisation that the contrast is not very good on this screen, I don't know if it's, it's good, better on mine, but actually there's a data flow that go, shows that as we move from traceability partner to traceability partner, there's a flipping between internal traceability and external traceability. This is really important for you to understand that external traceability is when you ship product to another person and then there's an internal process that when it comes into your operations under your control. And what the Dairy Traceability Working Group realised or came to realise is actually you have a very keen interest in making sure that what you build internally is able to be linked on demand to stuff that's happening externally. Now, there were some pragmatic reasons for why that might be the case. It's not just connecting, it's not just data flows, and it's not just providing data in the same language so you don't have to go from, from French to German to French to Russian, you know, like the same language, talking the same language. It's actually around practically, sometimes you wish to outsource some of your operations or acquire other parts of a value chain. And actually, when you do that, if it's a real pain in the ass, if actually they're talking a different language, literally, in terms of data. So actually by treating the whole value chain and talking the same language and being robust in the way you do things, your New Zealand operations and your offshore operations and offshore trading partners, you have a better chance of providing traceability data at a low cost and in a, in a rapid way if required, or perhaps even automated. So the view of the whole supply chain becomes very, very important in the relationship between internal and external traceability. Secondly, it's, it was recognised that we need to be really crisp and clear on who are the parties and roles that we play in that whole supply chain. Now to make this less es esoteric, I'm going to give you this. Here's a woman who's a quality manager in her day job, but actually the role that she provides, that's the party that she is in this particular supply chain, but actually the role she, provide, she, she plays in her life as a citizen, a mother, a wife, an employee, she pay, has multiple hats that she can wear. In the same way, people that are manufacturers can be brand owners or manufacturers can be just people that actually transship things. They translate, they may not be a brand owner, so they could be a traceable item creator or traceability participant. So what is the role of your shipping operator? You ring up and call main, uh, main Freight to come and move something. Are they a partner? Well, yes, they should be. Are they feeding data back in a way that's intelligible to you and downstream about where the data, what the product is, where it's been? Sometimes the shipping, depending on your trading partner, they don't care. It's just a box. They don't need. To, they say, I don't want to. Don't want to know what's inside. What happens if you wish them to, to have those conversations? The second key concept that came out of it was that actually we need to start using the international standardised words for things, one of which is critical tracking events. So critical tracking events are things that you must track, both internally and externally. And there are things like what's on the left here. Origination, where something starts, and aggregation, where things are put together, disaggregation, conversion, commingling, which is by the way a big issue in, in, in seafood. Um, shipping receipt, so and that's essentially where there's a, a key event, and they're called critical tracking events that must be 
tracked. Now, when, you, when we can determine, looking at our supply chain, what those events are, sorry, those critical tracking events are, what do we need to keep, you, there's a process that's internationally recognised around looking at the data elements, and they're called KDEs, key data elements, again, another international standard vocabulary, for those types of things that need to be captured. So that's typically the what, the where, when, the why. Now, so what is you know, the GS1 identifier, product ID, the barcode number, something like that, or an RFID tag. Um, the where is the location. How do you translate a location to make it internationally robust? It's a big question, actually, so that people understand where it came from. Time, well, that's pretty easy. And by the way, in seafood, they, people have, regulators in particular, have also learned that sometimes the date is hidden. It's encrypted almost. It's coded in a way that people don't understand um, about particularly catch dates. And then also a description, which is something that's often thought, what was actually happening at that stage when, when, it, when there was an event? So, that's, so we put those together, we end up with a process view of the world where we key, capture critical, tra uh, critical tracking events, key data elements, and then pass those on, on, on demand or where required to our trading partners. And the key thing is, when you come to external traceability, you've got a quite a complex supply chain. This is out of our international supply chain, a traceability document. And just sketching through, you've got hatcheries, you've got farms, you've got open market, you've got primary processes, you've got a number of different players. So the point is, how do you connect with those people? We're an export market. You need to think that through around how you ship things, how you put those into logistics units, how you put them into right down to trade items. Now you have some special areas. Now I work across lots of different sectors, as you learnt before. But actually there are some very demanding things that are coming through and your industry has taken a lead on that, I think. Uh, Seafood Standards Council, and I think Cathy's, Cathy's in the room here. European Union labelling requirements. The, the Europeans are really setting the pace on this because there's been some real scepticism about seafood. And so now they're wanting the normal stuff that you would normally see to be disclosed, catch area, date of catch, species. But actually they're starting to put things like what's highlighted down in the red, where on an individual piece of fish, for example, that's being sold, you need to disclose the production method and the date of first freezing and whether it's been refrozen. This is really demanding, particularly when you have offshore processing of fillets, where some stuff goes offshore, is it partially, you know, and the joke uh, that some of our members have talked about is that in some of your parts of your supply chain, there's a fresh date of birth. The date gets reset as the process. And so the fish can be really quite old. This is going to capture this. It's going to say the date of first freezing, and it can, must be uncoded. In other words, so someone looks at it and says, oh, that was August 2015. But overlaying all of this, all of these regulations, the Food Safety Modernisation Act or other things, there's actually a process of risk, looking at risk. And risk is determined, what I've given you on the left here is the list that's come out of the Food Safety Modernization Act in the US. And they've got a quite, a, quite a stringent methodology where they look at frequency of outbreaks and likelihood of contamination. But here's a suggestion for you, virtually any way you um, slice and dice this, seafood often end up very close, if not in the high risk category. So the requirements are going to be more on you than they are on something that's not high risk. Okay, so let's pull this all together and, and, uh, and finish off. So how do we and, uh, enhance trust? Well, our suggestion from GS1 that represents 5,000 companies in New Zealand and organisations is think about the issues, look at the direction of travel. It may not go as far as the Guilt Club, but actually it's moving quite a long way towards that. Take some of the suggestions we heard before, is that who do we want to sell to? Do we want to sell bargain basement? Or do we want to sell to the 40 million that actually are prepared to pay a real premium price? That's why the interesting discussion around the, GM, the GMOs for me earlier today. And then we need to look at that, to look at how we enhance trust. Now linked to this, there's some activities which I was talking with Rupert Holbrook somewhere here from, from uh, there you are, but just before, is that in the APEC agenda, New Zealand is leading the pack. APEC, we all know what APEC is. But actually New Zealand re has realised a few years ago, the APEC Business Advisory Council, that actually we are the third most efficient border in APEC, only behind Hong Kong and Singapore. Well, we're not go probably going to take over those guys, right? So we can modify things inside New Zealand, and actually we're probably not going to take over as being more efficient than those two. Open, open ports, 
large scale. But actually, if we can get the people we sell to, the other APEC economies, to be more efficient, then we can get more value as product moves across their border. And so uh, the APEC Business Advisory Council and then into APEC in the last few years, and GS1's been a very active component part of that, have been looking at where product slows down and, or stops at the border of the countries we sell to. And surprisingly, some of the reasons for it, are, we heard before, bribery and corruption, Suzanne are talking about that, um, we have to pay facilitation fees. Sometimes it's actually just the fact that they don't know what's in the container. They honestly don't know. The border officials literally don't know. So there's a strategy which was signed off by the leaders in APEC in Beijing last year, which actually I've given you um, a graphical implement uh, representation of this, where the, the governments are committed to trying to deal to some of these issues by putting things in better boxes. The step one, okay, product admission, putting things in a bucket, identifying things more precisely so you know exactly what's coming down and sharing that information between the trade and the government, knowing more about that individual product. Tell me about who's had it, who's had access to it, perhaps even which item it is. Now, serialization, as it's called, which is one product to another product, probably is not relevant for you, maybe relevant right at the time. It certainly is when you're talking about aeronautic parts, right, where individual items need to be traced, where there's a serial number on it. Where has it been and is it genuine? So if we can move our trading partners up that so that there's a degree of automation, then there's a greater chance that our product out of New Zealand will be green laned when it hits the border. So that's what we've been working on, connect into it. I know Samford's involved in this. Um, so to pull it all together, we, this is a model that is, well, it may, may be right, it may be wrong. Um, it hasn't been tested like Carolyn's going to talk about in an academic way. I'm an ac originally an academic, but... Fundamentally, um, GS1 has come up with a, trying to link some concepts together. We all want people to be loyal. That's what the brand New Zealand story is about. They want to be loyal to New Zealand. New Zealand, they buy New Zealand and they want it, they know that it's good. Well, what are the things that, that are linked to that? Well, some of it's image. Well, in this space, we know that image is partly about the fact that it's safe. It's not gonna, not gonna give me the trots, for example. Also, we know that trust is sometimes linked to transparency. Very heavily related. Suzanne will be delighted to hear me say that. But also, people trying it, consumer experience, they say, oh, this is great, and it's not going to kill me, it's not going to give me the trots, and actually I trust the supplier. We need to get into that space. We're increasingly realising that product and transactional data is very integral to drive that, um, that solution. And unfortunately for you, or fortunately, traceability is a key part of that. So um, I'm bang on time, and I want to perfectly finish off with something that I've ripped off uh, uh, an airbridge actually. You've, all of us fly, presumably, to our overseas markets and HSBC had this a couple of years ago. In the future, the food chain and the supply chain will merge. Now, we think that's highly likely and there's strong evidence that that's happening now. Food safety is going to be increasingly about the supply chain and, and demonstrating evidence on demand, potentially to a right through to a consumer, that it is good, it's the real thing, it's the real deal, what's the halo effect around it, which could be include the New Zealand story, because actually I want to keep on buying this product. Thank you for your time.